This would be the 24th lesson in the book of Ephesians. And we're in a very rich section here where the apostle is teaching tonight, he'll teach us Gentiles what it really took to save us. Now he's continuing to elaborate on what we were when Christ found us. He sought us out, you know. And when he found us, we were, we were not in good shape at all. In fact, we were in a hopeless state, as we'll find. He's already spoken of the human race in general as being dead in trespasses and sins, uh, walking according to the course of the world, and dominated by Satan. That's the human race in particular. Now, I know he's going to concentrate on the Gentile segment. That was Jew and Gentile alike fell into that category. Now he's going to concentrate on the Gentile world. The fact that there were Jews and Gentiles, see, this complicated the case of salvation from a human, from a human point of view. Because for 1,500 years, God had concentrated on one, one people. He chose them out of all other people, preferred them before other people, which, of course, contradicts a lot of ideas about what God is. A lot of people have no idea that God could do such a thing as this, but he did. And he spent a considerable time reminding Israel of this. For instance... Now, this is God saying this. This has to register the conscience of people because this is a God a lot of people do not know. But they can, if they, if they will hear the word. This is in Deuteronomy 7, 6. For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself, above all people that are on the face of the earth. Can God do such a thing as that? Well, there you are, right? There you are. There you are. Yes, God can do this. And yes, he did this. And it was a small number, percentage-wise. The least of all nations, not the biggest. God really isn't interested in just people per se. It's his purpose that he's interested in. Now here's something else he said, Deuteronomy 10, 15. Only the Lord had, delight, had a delight in thy fathers to love them, and he chose their seed after them, even you above all people, as it is this day. <laughs> Now remember, he's going to talk about the Gentiles, which are the, all the other people. And how he saved some people from the Gentiles. Even though he hadn't paid a lot of attention to them. <clears throat> Back to the prophecies, I'm going to be found of them that didn't seek me. And those that didn't call, I'll, I will find them before they find me. He foretold that. So as people say, you can't find God till you seek him. I was fine, found of them that sought me not. See, you've got to be careful how you say things. Yeah. Got to be careful how you say things. Yeah. God has spoken on his issue. And the prophets, he did speak of the Gentiles being included in in, but it was all its kind of vague. It wasn't, wasn't crystal clear at all. I gave you some text here where he said that Gentiles would come to them. Gentile take hold of the skirt of a Jew and say, show me your God. And they'd flow into it. And they'd say, let's go up to Jerusalem. And, but it was all kind of vague and clear because it wasn't the emphasis 
The acceptance of the Gentiles wasn't the emphasis of the prophets. And so as a result, the Jews kind of glossed over it. People still have this tendency. There's a lot of things that God says that are true, but are not emphasized. And because they're not like in capital letters, they kind of read over them. An emphasis doesn't mean you neglect everything else. But people, they do think this way. If you were to say to some people, well, I believe that God predestinates people. Are you saying that people that are Aren't that people? People are chosen independently of their will, and they can't. They can't emphasize something. I'm continually astounded at this. Salvation is by grace through faith. Are you saying that you don't have to work? This is a human tendency, and it's a terrible one. We must labor to try and dissipate this kind of thinking. People tend to think this way. If God doesn't underline something, they think like it's unimportant. So they just gloss over it. So they, that's what the Jews did, the Gentiles. They, the Jews developed this like contempt <laughs> for the Gentile world. And they carried it too far, as you know. So now he's going to turn to the Gentile segment of the church, which was probably the majority of the church at Ephesus. Remember, the Israelites had all the advantages, all of them. Now, here it is, Paul states it, Romans 9, 4, and 5. Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption, that's God taking them for his own people. The glory, that's God making himself known to them. The covenants. The giving of the law, the service of God, that tabernacle service, the promises, whose are the fathers, and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came, whose over all God blessed forever. So that's all the advantages given to the Jews. So this was over a period of 1,500 years. <laughs> now the United States hasn't been around long enough to even be in that category. Huh? It's been long, around long enough to be in that category. But there are still people who think that God has favored the United States because they've got a couple of three benefits, a few benefits over a very short period of time. Compared to this, what about constant God really concentrating by one group of people for 1,500 years? See, it develops a sort of a mentality. The people got to thinking... They were really the only ones. They didn't associate their, themselves with being chosen by God. So Paul's going to address this now. The details of the conversion of the Gentiles were not given in the prophets. They told him that they would come. He'd lift up his hand to them. They'd be drawn to Jesus. They'd flow into the Jerusalem. But the details weren't given. So Paul now is going to show how that saving the Gentiles contradicted every form of human reasoning. You cannot account for the Gentiles being saved by human reasoning. It contradicts human reasoning. Genesis two weeks ago. The things that we said about the nations, the things that we said about the nations, how God yeah. scattering them out so he could gather them to himself yeah, again. That's right. So our text is, Hebrew, is uh, Ephesians 2, 11 and 12. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision, by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. And at that time, ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Now, I would venture to say that very few Christian people in our country would agree that before they were in Christ, they were Gentiles. 
I doubt, I doubt that that would be received by very many people. If it would, they would like, what are you saying? What are you saying? What do you mean? Because they've been taught God has always looked at everybody the same way. They've taught, they've been taught that's the way God is. God just looks at everybody the same way. And here for the history of the world up until Christ, this wasn't the case at all. He didn't look at Enoch and Noah the same way he looked at everybody else. And he sure didn't look at Israel the same way as he looked at everybody else. But see, that yet this mentality has, has been developed as being preached. There, there, isn't, there isn't a day. There, you won't go by a day, one day, 24 hours without, if you listen to any kind of religious communication, that God will not be represented as having the same attitude toward everybody. You will, and yet you, you've got this gigantic contradiction in Israel here. What are you going to do with this? This is something God did who left a hold of a, a greater percentage, which is probably up like the 98% of <laughs> something like that. That, that. that may be a little low. 98% of the world was ignored by God while he focused on this small body of people. So now he turns to and there's here's a group of people in the body with some Jews that came out of this mass of apparently neglected people. Remember. Now when the Lord says remember, it's always in a certain context. It's not just look at the past. <laughs> That's not it. It's just a context. It's not just a generality. Sometimes remembering is devastating very harmful some things when some things are remembered. Men are not just to extract the things they like to remember. I mean, it's not pleasant to remember what you were before you came into Christ. But lest you become wise in your own conceits and give a bit too much credit to yourself, it's just good to remember what you were. Gentiles, remember what you were. Remembering is like picking fruit off a tree. You gotta get in the right field. You have to stand by the right tree. Remember the right things. Otherwise, remembering will go against you. You may remember like that Joe Doe hurts you. They live with that thing for year in, year out. You live with it, you remember it, you recollect it, and it's like digging a hole in the ground. The remembering can be bad. Remember, you might recall that mixed multitude that came out of Is Egypt with Israel. Now, at this point, Israel's got a bad rap by the preachers because they didn't know what they were talking about. They said the Israelites remembered a diet they had in Israel of onions and leeks and fish. This wasn't the diet the Israelites had. They weren't eating high on the hog those 40 or 400 years. This was that, it tells you who it is, the mixed multitude. The people from Egypt that came out of Egypt with Israel, those are the gripers. Of course, it spread through the whole camp. They want, they were, I say that because... The best of us make some blunders in the pulpit we don't mean to make. I mean, it, it, that's a human frailty. But some things, people really gone overboard on it. And first thing you know, people are picking up and saying things that really aren't in the Bible. That mixed multitude murmured. They, when they remembered, they remembered the fish, cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, and garlic that they ate in Egypt. Well, it didn't work any good. In this text, believers, non-Jewish believers are admonished to recall the condition in which Christ found them. He's already told what the general condition of humanity was, dead and trespassed and sins and so forth. He's already told you that. Now, what this is going to do, this is going to highlight a couple of things. It's going to highlight what, not by works, what that means. 
It's going to highlight saved by grace, what that means. See, he's going to spell it out for us. He's going to work it out for us. The language assumes in time, remember in times, time past, that there's like a line of demarcation. There's some point you begin there and think backward. That's not like today. When it says remember that in time past, it doesn't say mean from August, what is it, 7th back. It means from your conversion back. Remember, and that's just an important point to get. Remember from your conversion, some of us have to go back. We've got we to think back a long, long time. But if you think back, you can remember the exact point in time. For me, at six, 68 years ago. <laughs> but I can remember just as clear as a bell when I contemplated on it. My memory can go back to that point now. From that point on, Think about before that. Well, I was rather young, but I was still a Gentile. Young Gentiles aren't nice Gentiles. Just because you're a child Gentile doesn't mean you're acceptable. Philistines had children, too. You know what God told them to do with them, don't you? You, do, you haven't forgot that, have you? Huh? The Amalekites. They had children. Didn't they have children? I say, didn't they have children? And what did God say to do with them? You know, I don't like to think about that. Well, think about it because you escaped. <laughs> think about it. Time passed. That's an important point to make. That until a time was at the point a person was born again or added to the church or joined unto the Lord, from that point backward is different than from that point forward. Until that, and that time, it wasn't like a, just a little bit of that time something happened. This, this was what we call contiguous time. From the day you were born all the way up until you were born again, and if that was when you were 75, it was like one Things kept getting worse, 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 worse. It was one, it wasn't just at times, what he's going to say was what the condition, at certain times, it was that's the way it was all the time until you come into Christ. You remember that, that this is what Christ lifted you out of. Scripture depicts it as treasuring up wrath day by day. By day, if you came to Christ or Christ found you when you were young, you heaped up, you didn't heap up as much wrath as if you came later. Some came later. For those in Christ, each day is a new beginning. For those out of Christ, each day is just an addition to the former one. Got to see that. There's nothing but an extension of time, time past, in which the individual was being condemned. And that condition continued for some time. In time past, you were Gentiles in the flesh. <laughs> now again, this is not popular language today, but this does need to be restored. In other words, say you were Gentiles by birth or nations, Gentiles also means nations, nations in the flesh, carnal Gentiles, Gentiles by physical descent, heathen, not Jewish, Gentiles as to our, your bodily condition, and heathen in a physical sense. Well, what it means is this, you remember how I said you chose, he chose Israel above all of the people, that's all the all of the people, that's what the, <laughs> the Gentiles are all the other people. Remember now that you were there. 
The point he's going to develop is that the Gentiles had no reason for hope. None at all. Everything God gave, he gave to the Jews. It's listed in Romans 9, 3 through 5. We, you should be familiar with that text. But everything he gave, he gave to the Jews. He gave the law to them. He gave the promises to them, the prophets to them, the manifestations of his glory he gave to them. All gave the, he gave it all to them. And, they, and even then, they were the fleshly descendants of Abraham. So Abraham was really the point, not the, not the people. And when God called and chose Abraham and delivered the promise to him of, of his offspring, there was a sense in which all of the people were excluded. To whom pertain the promise? All of the people were excluded at that point. When the purpose of God, I understand that the purpose of God, they were, they were included, but God hadn't revealed his purpose at this time. The Gentiles are classed as the Gentiles which know not God. 1 Thessalonians 4, 5. Why don't they know God? Because God didn't make himself known to them. You say, what about Nineveh? All right, what did God make known of himself to Nineveh? The only thing they got from God was 40 days and you're going to be destroyed. That like was it. <laughs> that was it. They had enough of a sense of deity to know maybe if we repent they have some kind of effect on this. That kind of mentality not too common in our country. Something happens, they say, well, we got another plan. <clears throat> we can correct this. We can correct this. We can correct it. Don't worry. We got, we got another plan. It's going to cost a lot of money, but we, we can do it. We can do it. It didn't take none of a three days to figure out they couldn't do it, and all they had to go on was a word. That's all they had to go on was a word. There was no great sign other than the sign of the prophet Jonah. I don't know what he looked like when he... After he'd been took up an apartment in a whale's belly for three days, I don't know what he looked like when he came out, but they didn't have any other kind of visible attestation of the truth of this message, but they believed it. Uh -huh. <laughs> Think all the people that you've told the gospel to that have believed it. Yeah. And you told them more than you're going to be damned. You, yeah. Surely you told them more than that. Yeah. <laughs> That's all the message they never got. But I'm showing you is that God didn't divulge a lot of things to the Gentiles. He says they are called uncircumcision by the circumcision. Circumcision was a sign and seal of the covenant that he had with them and the righteousness that was given to Abraham because of his faith. That was their proof that God had made a covenant with them. Stephen refers to the covenant of circumcision. That was a outward external sign that they belonged to God and it was, but it was a private sign it wasn't on their forehead yeah, that's right. <laughs> you know uh, the beast he puts a mark on the forehead right, yeah. and on the hand but that's not where Israel had its sign you know, so it wasn't a sign for the Gentiles it was a sign for the Jews that's what it was a sign for. Signs aren't for unbelievers. Signs are for believers in the sense of a circumcision being a sign. That meant something to you if you were a, circum if you were a Jew. It meant something to you. If you said, well, we have a covenant with God. Gentile says, well, I'd prove it. Well, you know, they wouldn't. You get my point. So they called the Gentiles the uncircumcision. They didn't have a sign. They didn't have any kind of a proof that God had them in mind at all. And it was a term of derision. You remember David said to Goliath, who is it said of Goliath, who is this uncircumcised? See, Philistine, when they said uncircumcised, that was a term of derision. This is someone that's not a people. That's what they are. No formal identity with God. 
uncircumcised. That meant they had no covenant with God. No formal identity with God other than creator and created. That was, they did have that. God made no covenant with them. He gave them no written law. He made no promises directly to them. He did not provide them a means of where, wherein they could serve him, like the tabernacle service. All such things were given only to the Jews. They call them the uncircumcision. See, the, the Gentiles produced Socrates and Plato, but they have no Moses. They don't have any David. They don't have any Isaiah. Not the Gentiles. That's where we come from. We come from this pool of people. Remember, we were Gentiles, according to the flesh, that is our, as human beings in the world, as we might say. At that time, we were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. At that time, that, that means it's not that way anymore, <laughs> praise God. Amen. Praise God, it's not that way anymore. At that time, doesn't that refer to a point in time, like March 3rd, but a period of time extending from birth to new birth, that period of time. And if it was before Christ, a whole life. There was, this was not ups and downs, sometimes without Christ, sometimes with Christ. It wasn't like that. Without Christ. What does that mean, without Christ? Well, some other versions say they, it means separate, separated from is what it means, separate from Christ. I just think of the implications of this, being as God's, hinged everything on Christ. He's given everything to Christ. He's given the people to Christ. There isn't anything God has for you that isn't in Christ. Now in view of that, think about without Christ. That means you get zero. Without Christ. Had no Messiah. Without the Messiah. Young's literal says apart from Christ. Utterly apart from Christ, the Living Bible says, living apart from Christ, without any connection with Christ, did not know about Christ. That's a very weak, oh, that's, a, that's, a, that's stupid, quite frankly. Hasn't the faintest idea about Christ. That's, that's terrible. That's terrible. You were at that time separated, living apart from Christ, excluded from all part of him, Amplified says. The word translated without means separate from, it's not, it has nothing to do with knowledge. It's not talking about your knowledge like you didn't know him, didn't know about him, or didn't know who he was. That's not what he means. He means you had no connection. You were like a far enough away that nothing could pass from Jesus to you. Remember that. Be without Christ is to be excluded from all the benefits that come through him. Now, do you, there are still people today from pulpits and from rostrums and from media that tell people outside of Christ that Christ will give them something. There are still people teaching this. And it's not true. When you're without Christ, you do not get anything from Christ. Enough of this sympathetic, tear-jerking type approach to Christ. Things that are associated with Christ, let's just name some of them. Forgiveness and acceptance, they rank there pretty high. Fellowship and righteousness. Reconciliation and sanctification, intercession and guidance and help and the new birth and his love and the gift of the Holy Spirit and a host of other benefits. When you're without Christ, 
you do not get those. Amen. Amen. If a person wants those, which I doubt that anyone apart from Christ wants them in the first place. Why would, why would a person who's out of Christ want something like that? I'm telling you, they don't. Yeah. It takes the gospel to awaken a want yeah. 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 for things like this. No matter how, matter how morally good the person may be, they may be like morally superb. A lot of people that are not in Christ are actually better neighbors than people that are in Christ. But they're still without Christ. They still can't get anything Christ has to offer. Christ is a dispenser. They can't know God because that's dispensed from God. They can't get grace because that's dispensed by Christ. Everything comes from Christ. So when you're without Christ, well, we didn't have any of these things. So in view of that, how could you be saved by works? <laughs> if you're without Christ, you're shut up to what you do. Is that not right? Without Christ means all you got to work with is what you do. So about the time someone begins thinking they'll be able to address the situation, he says, not a work, lest any man should boast. So if you don't get it from Christ, it does, it's not honored. Say, what about Cornelius? It doesn't say Cornelius was received. It said his prayers were received and his gifts were honored. And so the messenger was sent to him to tell him how he could be received. Amen. <laughs> so you're without Christ. Remember now, I said, remember. Now, it doesn't make any difference whether you're five years old or 50. Does it? No. If you're without Christ, how old you are doesn't make any difference. We're talk we understand we're talking about a child that has some kind of cognition, some of, some abilities of thought. <clears throat> and you were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. The commonwealth means like a national group of people. There are certain things you couldn't get from God unless you were a Jew. That's why we had proselytes. Well, proselytes. Gentiles became... Jews by proselyte because you couldn't get anything the Jew had if you, if you weren't in the commonwealth. Like if a Roman citizen, you had to be a Roman citizen to get the rights of Roman citizenship. Now we, uh, and you forfeited those rights if you violated your citizenship. Some versions refer to it as citizenship or not rights of a nation or national rights, community of Israel, membership of Israel. The idea was here's this body of people. God's identified with them. All Everything he has to give, he's given to them. The law, his promises, his love, his glory, his service. And if you're not, not only were you not part of that, you were aliens. That means you were like, Hostile to this. That's what alienated. It means there's a friction. If it's not on your side, it's on God's side. Alienated from God. These were alienated from the commonwealth. They didn't couldn't, couldn't fit in. That's a divine manner now. The people trump the person. I mean, I don't know how else you could really view this. People, common of Israel, trumped the person, Gentile. So if you were a Gentile, you didn't make any difference how honorable you were. You had to some way get connected with this people. Now God's teaching people something here. He's teaching people something. In Christ Jesus, it's really the same way, if you can see it, that that if you want the benefits of God, you've got to get connected with God's people somewhere. So you hear the message, and you're added to the body. You, this has got to happen. or you, This is how God works. Amen. God revealed it there under Israel. These uh, covenants, now no, it's an interesting term, covenants of promise. <laughs> what were covenants of promise? 
These were what we will call bilateral covenants. They were covenants that had nothing at all to do with what men did. Men had no effect at all on these promises. Like, for instance, the coming of the seed of the woman. Did that depend on what men did? <laughs> this had nothing to do with what men did. He didn't say, if you're faithful, the seed of the woman. I don't know. This, this didn't have anything to do with the response of humanity to the promise. Nothing at all. The sending of a Savior who would bear the iniquities of us all. That didn't hinge on anything men did. The faithfulness of Israel had nothing to do with this promise. Nothing at all to do with this promise. In the fullness of time, Jesus came. Sent, he was sent into the world. In the fullness of time to deliver us from this present evil world. And it had nothing at all to do with the condition of men or response of men or this sort of thing. This is a covenant of promise. I will. The circumcision of the heart. Moses told us, well, God will circumcise your heart. This wasn't, if you do this, God will circumcise your heart. Or if you do that, God will circumcise your heart. That wasn't the kind of promise it was. In fact, he told Israel, circumcise your hearts. He told them to do it. They didn't get it done, so he told them God will do it. Yeah. New covenant. God will make a new covenant. It didn't, this wasn't Israel, if you keep my commandments, I'll make a new covenant. This isn't the way it was. See, their, their promises were this way. Do and live. But the covenants of promise were not on that wise. Amen. They were unconditional, absolutely unconditional. In the fullness of time, Jesus came. In the fullness of time, the new covenant came. In the fullness of time, the Holy Spirit was poured forth. See, all of these things happened according to God's purpose, completely independent of what men were doing. In fact, on earth, things were growing worse, worse, worse. And then God pours forth his spirit right in the middle of all this. He didn't say, well, is it time for people ready for this yet? That wasn't it. It was a covenant of promise. No such covenant was ever given to the Gentiles. Any information about the conversion of the Gentiles was given to the Jews, not to the Gentiles. Right. Prophets told the Jews about the Gentiles. What happened? The Gentiles weren't told this. There was no prophet sent to them. No covenants of promise were given to them. The point is made that this is an important thing. These are the most important promises that should be preached. Today, there are promises that have ifs attached to them. I understand that. There are promises like that. But these are not the kind of promises that should dominate the preaching. The type of promises that should, that should dominate preaching are these unconditional bilateral promises that tell you what God's going to do, and that's what stimulates faith. Amen. That's what causes faith. To as some have said, rise in the heart. No earthly condition, however bleak it may have been, could have stopped Jesus from coming, could have stopped Pentecost from happening, could have stopped the gospel being preached to the Gentiles. Nothing, these, these were epochs that were promised, and nothing could have stopped them at all from from. None of them were given to the Gentiles. During that period of the old covenant, the Gentiles were com Depicted as coming to the Jews. I give you a few texts there. So it's a great work when the Gentiles. <laughs> it's a great work when the Gentiles were saved. It's a tremendous work of God yes, that this had happened amen. in view of this situation. Well, he, he magnifies. He puts the magnifying glass down a little closer, having no hope and without God in the world. Now yeah. well, the situation was this, God had made no commitment to them. He had made revelations about them, but no commitment to them. Yeah, there's a big difference. <laughs> big difference, brethren. Think of all the commitments he's made to the church. You think he made a lot to Israel. Oh, think what he made to the church. What he'll do. I tell you, they're, they're phenomenal. But you had to get in Christ to get these. That's the point. He made no agreement with them or sent no profit to them to assure them things are going to get better. Things are going to be better. 
He told Abraham, that's going to be a seed, going to bless the world. He didn't tell any Gentile that. He didn't say to Nebuchadnezzar, who was his servant. Nebuchadnezzar was his servant. He didn't say, now someday, Nebuchadnezzar, I'm going to bless the world. And Assyria and Egypt and Israel are all going to be together. He didn't tell that to them. That, that's a group of people we came out of. God didn't tell us anything. The best thing the Gentiles could hold up are the Socrates and the Plato's and the philosophers of the world. That's the best thing. Alexander the Great and military geniuses, they can hold this up. But these, these people can't save anybody. And now that they died, they're utterly powerless. Me, the Gentiles didn't have anything. They were without Christ. Aliens from Israel. He said they have no hope. No hope. What does it mean to be without hope? There's no, there's no reason to suspect things could ever be any different than they are now. The future is not rosy at all. From, this to, from one point of view, everybody's under, under the dominion of sin, but the Jews had, had some hope because yeah. God spoke to them. So they had people that looked for redemption. See? They had people who waited for the consolation of Israel. <laughs> there was a man, Joseph of Arimathea, who was waiting for the kingdom of God. This wasn't true of any Gentile, unless they had pro become a proselyte. This was not true of any Gentile. There was no Gentile out there waiting for the kingdom of God, see, because they were without Hope. This is what produced the hope. Was the, these pro covenants of promise? That's what produced this hope. Amen. But the Gentiles didn't have anything like this. So when God says, "I was found to them that sought me not," mm -hmm. <laughs> some people still find that very difficult to receive. They had no scriptures. The Gentiles had no scriptures. I think of that woman of Samaria. They were Samaritans were half breeds, but that woman of Samaria said we. They, she knew about the Messiah, but she didn't get it from any Gentile writings. Yeah. <laughs> she didn't learn that from Gentile writings. That's from the Jewish prophets. And she picked up on that. When she was convinced Jesus was the Christ, it was the Christ that the Jewish prophets talked about. See, the Gentile prophets didn't talk about this. If there was such a thing as Gentile prophets. They had no scriptures. They couldn't look at creation and all of a sudden have hope. Right. <laughs> Having no hope means there's nothing that they could do about their situation. Well, with that in mind, not of works. See how, see how that opens? See how that opens up? Not of works, I said to me and said both. So God just shows you in the Gentiles why it's not a works. They, they couldn't study their way out of hopelessness. No way. The pit in which they found themselves is too deep to climb out. Not of works. Lest any man should boast. They're without hope. Their condition couldn't improve with time. Maybe it'll get better. No, they're without hope. Wasn't going to get any better at all. No mighty deliverer could rise from the Gentile ranks. They didn't think maybe some great super person will rise up and take us out of this condition. No hope. They're without hope. They couldn't even think. They couldn't even think in terms of a Messiah. The only person that could even think of a Messiah or a Savior or a deliverer were people to whom God revealed himself. They're the only people in the history of the world that could even think of a deliverer and a savior that could bring them out. Not of works, <laughs> lest any man should boast. They couldn't produce a savior. They're without hope. Not a shred of hope among them. So when you see people that are just beaten down, they have no hope, they're just clinically called depressed and so forth, what's the trouble? They have no hope. They have no hope. That's the trouble. Who has hope? Only the people in Christ have hope. Well, this is the hope. We can preach this hope. 
to preach it. They are without God in the world. Of all places, without God in the world. What a dreadful consideration. This is the only place in all the Bible without God is mentioned. This is it. Paul told Athenian philosophers he's not far from every one of us. They were still without him, though. That's right. yeah. Even though he wasn't far. <laughs> See, not, not, not far is a far cry from being with us. It's a far cry. That angel wasn't far from the Egyptians when he looked at him from behind the cloud. Mm -hmm. right? right? He wasn't far, but it sure wasn't any comfort for the Egyptians. Ah, but on the other side of the cloud, that was another story there, wasn't it? They had hope. As Gentiles, we, know we had no access to divine help without God. God is called our, our helper. The Lord is our helper is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. But see, when you're without God, don't help her. Yeah. Don't have a helper. So don't be offering a helper to someone who's outside of God. Yes, amen. The only helper really they've got is you. Mm -hmm. That's the truth of the matter. Yeah. You're, the, you're the appointed helper. Uh -huh. to comfort the afflicted and so forth. But they don't have access. You're going to have to... Stand in the gap, yes, right. you might say, for the person. By nature, we were locked into this situation of without God, we couldn't get out of it. Our adversary was more powerful than we were. It held us in this, in this condition. Without God, without hope, and without God in the world. So what? So what has Paul accomplished by accentuating what we were? Well, he's. This is what it means to be dead in trespasses and sins. This is like opening it up. This is cracking the shell and opening it up and see what's involved in, in that death and trespasses and sins. This is what living in step with the world. This is this is what it means. When you li when you walk when you live in the world as of the world, this, this is what it means. It means you don't have anything from God. So if a person thinks they can do this. Walk in concert with God, walk according to the course of the world, and still have access to God. See how wrong they are. Yeah. Uh -huh. No, this is not true at all. We were children of disobedience and subjects of the wrath of God, and we could not do anything about it. Or to say it another way, by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. See, does not make perfect sense? Now, once you see this that he spelled out, it makes perfect sense. The truth of the matter is that if God did not take the initiative in salvation, there wouldn't be any salvation. That's the point he's making. There would have been none. If he did not send a Savior, there wouldn't have been a Savior. If his kindness had not been toward us, we'd have never received kindness from anyone else. Yeah. That's, the way, that's the way it is. So salvation is holy of the Lord. Yeah. There's absolutely no question about it. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. But this is how Paul nailed that thing down. And it's, uh, yeah. it's just plain marvelous. That's all it is. I think I'll close there. Any of you have something you'd like to add tonight? Yeah, Romans chapter 9. Verse 15 and 16. For he saith unto Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. Yeah. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion, so that it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Yeah, amen. amen. There it is. Amen. Yeah. See, all these things, this sheds light on all this. Yeah. Thankfulness. Oh, you can't just bring forth thankfulness without thought or reason. You amen. have to commit yourself to it. It's not some kind of generic expression we give to God. Amen. We commit ourselves to meditate and carefully consider what was involved in being delivered from sin and in doing that then. Then thankfulness is produced amen. to the God who could only do what God can do. See, if the Jews...
were rebuked for not taking advantage of Christ, how much more the Gentiles? Yeah, that's right. yeah, huh? Yeah. He lifted up his hand to the Gentiles and was found and he found them. How much more to neglect that? Um, I was considering when you said that um, without Christ you get zero. Um, <laughs> the scriptures say that you cannot eat of both the devil's table and of Christ. Uh -huh. So you're either e eating of the Lord's or of Satan's. But if you're eating of the Lord's, you get great benefit. But if you're eating of Satan's, you lose the benefit of the Lord's and you gain nothing from Satan. That's, That's right. right. Amen. 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 Yes, Brother Tony. I like the uh, the thought of Cornelius now. This man found himself in the wrong, he was in a wrong camp, but he yeah. was smart. Though. That's right. He was smart. He favored God's people. That's right. Saying he, showed, he built synagogues for him, and he was in a position where he could, and God took notice of this. That's right. And uh, now we know about Cornelius. I'm sure there's other men, you know, where there was keen. That see oh, the, yeah. the people that, that recognize the people of God, yeah. and you know this now the same principle uh, today in the kingdom. Now you it's, you need to <laughs> identify God's people and get and get right in there with them. That's do right. What you can do. Amen. Yeah, you know, I, I like that. I tell you, you know this this sort of national crisis that we have. Whether there's a lot of disasters happening, the economy falling apart, how believers conduct themselves during this time will determine whether any light goes out or not. Your text says that, wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh. Um, I thought of the scripture that also says ye are grafted into the olive branch. That's right. So this is also what we've been looking at in That's Genesis. Right. Um, Japheth shall move into Shem. Shem's, yes, Shem's tent. And this is the Gentiles being right. grafted into the Jews' olive tree. And this is a work that couldn't have been done That's a right. man work, man's work alone. And it's just not a handful of them. It's a, it's a lot. A lot of branches are being grafted in. Amen. You can see how um, God's wisdom is employed in just, just separating a small number that he was going to focus his attention on because um, he's, he was actually it was, it was being merciful to the rest of the world because had he just just looked at all, every, see, he, he would have had to have a flood every few years. I mean, it, it, but he focused his attention down on, on a cultured people that they actually were a miraculous people that he made so that he could, in, in, in the long term, they would, they, would, they would be his instrument of fulfilling his eternal purpose and bringing salvation, making it possible for him, extending himself Amen. to the Gentiles and adding them. And yet Paul here, he says, one, one apostles to the Gentiles, the whole nation, just all these masses of people, and yet he, uh, he gave him the wisdom to know what he was doing. That's right. Paul knew exactly what God had, was doing here, and so what, what's, what's the remedy? He's opening it up to them, so they yeah. can see that you didn't have any hope without... You look at it this way, that the culture of Israel, the ultimate reason for it. Mm -hmm. Now God's going to send his son into the world, right? Yes. He's made this appointment. He's going to come in as a babe, and he's going to have to grow in wisdom and in stature and favor with God and man. So what God really was doing with Israel, he produced an environment in which the son could grow up when he was here. Amen. Huh? And learn the scriptures and grow in wisdom and in stature and favor. That's what it actually was all about. Yeah. And anyone else that got done that, that was just on the side. Yeah, right. But that's what it was about. He would not send his son to Rome to grow up yeah, right. or to Alexandria to grow up. He was going to send him to a place where the knowledge of God was available, mm -hmm. where the service of God was in place. And where recollections of God were there in Scripture, see, that's actually what this was all about. Amen. Yeah. yeah. I don't know why I didn't see that when I was young. Boy, that is. That clears up a lot of things. You can stumble around on why did Israel do this and why did they do that? But see, 
The purpose for dealing with Israel was not to convert them. Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, as you've gone through this, kind of a new perspective has, has occurred to me. Uh, men are want, at least some people are, to say, well, why doesn't God just save everybody? Mm -hmm. that's, that's the wrong perspective. Mm -hmm. From the fall, everybody was without hope until God intervened. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think what we're going to find whenever this is all concluded is that everywhere there was a just cause for mercy, God found it out. Mm -hmm. And that his wisdom and, and his... Um, his ability to save, it, it, these are going to be magnified. That wherever men weren't saved, there wasn't a just cause for God to intervene. Yeah, good, that's good. And that he's yeah. sorting this out. And that in that day, there'll be no one that can accuse him. It'll be right. His, yeah. his determinations will be shown to be right. Not just because, he, you know, I yeah. said so. Will understand the rightness of it. Amen. See when the law said this do and live. Jesus did that. <laughs> Where's a man. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Remember the prophet said he'd magnify the law and make yeah. it honorable. Amen. Jesus Christ proved the law was legitimate. Yes, amen. Amen. It was not just an impossibility yeah. if God was in this situation. Uh -huh. And Jesus proved it. Amen. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes, Brother Aaron. I think the idea that I got uh, from just in general, you know, from the church world, was that Israel was kind of just a failed project. It just yeah. didn't turn out, you know, like yeah. like it was intended. And, <laughs> and so he, he just kind of swung the door open to everyone because, you know, kind of plan B. But uh, the things really do start to come into clearer focus. Like you said, the doctrine of Romans is that God's dealings with the Jews was to prove that, that righteousness has to be imputed. And God's not dealing with the Gentiles proved that righteous. They both proved the same thing. That's right. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. They couldn't be saved by religious works or any other kind of work. Included all under sin that he might have mercy, mercy. upon all. Amen. 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 All right. All right, everybody.